In fact, when we got there, we would knock on doors to find a place to live because we're just trying to save money for college. That was kind of our thing. I often say that in, in America, we like success, but we don't like successful people. He bet on himself. Yeah. And he was right. Take some big balls to do stuff like that. Whatever you think you, your kids know, double or, or triple yeah. it. And I still do it to this day. I get about five to seven leads an hour knocking on doors, just saving people money on their insurance. And I think when you want to grow in business, it's more of a game at some point, right? You, you keep score with money. So you blaming lawyers? If they don't see you working, they're not going to want to work hard. They're going to think you're entitled. Do you see a lot of vandalism here? In, in I think there is. I think there's more than anybody wants to admit. All right, guys, I have a very, very special treat for you today. Today, we're talking about wearing the business hat uh, of insurance agency. We're not talking about insurance adjusters. We're not talking about a roofing business. We're talking about insurance business. Troy Thompson in the studio. Thank you so much for being Appreciate here. Appreciate it, Dimitri. Yeah. Pinnacle Insurance in Minnesota. We're 15 minutes away from your office. And um, I'm excited to offer a little bit of insight coming from their insurance agency owner perspective. I know a lot of roofers, they do want to network with us. And uh, hardest market in the history of our country for insurance. I'm happy to explain what a hard market is sure. if you don't know. But it's a crazy time in the industry. So thanks for having me. Absolutely, would love to have a conversation, but I have about 22, 23 questions here. Uh, I would like to start with early on, um, all the way back to your career and your background. You started out after college doing doing door to door okay. book sales. How did you get into That's that? Right. And what did you learn? I like how you've done your research, <laughs> Southwestern. It's a uh, book sales company still around out of Nashville, Tennessee. They focus on college kids and you go to a different state for the summer and literally knock on doors selling encyclopedias. Now, that was 25 plus years ago when I did it. I have those guys knocking at my door, yeah. selling books, selling religious books. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily <laughs> religious books. Yeah. It's for um, to help no, kids with yours school. Yours not, but like it's very popular. Oh, selling tough. books is... If you can sell door books to door. in 2024, you can do anything, right? And even... 25, 30 years ago to sell books. I mean, that's not easy. It's not sexy. We would knock on doors 80 hours a week, 80 hours a week, uh, 7.30 a.m., Monday through Saturday to 9.30 p.m. We'd have meetings on Sunday. We'd go to a state. We didn't know anyone. In fact, when we got there, we would knock on doors to find a place to live because we're just trying to save money for college. That was kind of our thing. Wow. And uh, Do you have any stories? I want to hear stories from that time yeah. that you still think about today. I got a pretty cool story, and uh, this was in Bentonville, Arkansas. My uh, first summer selling books, I was in Bentonville, Arkansas, and um, we know that area is the home of Walmart. So got in with the community, got to learn, got to know a lot of the, the people, and um, they said, well, have you knocked on Jim and Lynn Walton's door yet? Okay, this is a company or you know, a family at the time, each child was worth about 20 billion and that was 25 plus years ago i was pretty nervous but i i got the the courage to knock on their door and the, the one of the cool lessons we know sam walton drove around a little beat up ford pickup truck this family jim and lynn walton with their kids and everything was in a very modest home worth maybe three hundred thousand dollars at the time wow that you could no, not gated worth 20 billion dollars i knocked right on the door their son answered jim came to the door and uh, I told him about my, my you know, I'm going to be honest, I didn't sell them. It would be a great story if I sold them books. But he was like, we're pretty dialed in with books. You know, that was one of my stories. Just the amount of I wanna butterflies to talk to somebody worth $20 billion. And he was a super nice guy. And I guess the lesson I learned was, you know, to be humble and not, not spend all your money, which is the Walmart way. That's so <laughs> cool. But I want to unpack that a little bit because... There's so, so much to unpack here. Number one, obviously, the, the whole like not acting your wealth actual was uh, listening to a divorce attorney uh, yesterday on a podcast on the airplane. The divorce guy, he's like, and every podcast, I forgot his name, but he said that, um, you know, a lot of people acting, you know, he, he's a divorce lawyer, so he knows who's swimming naked, right? Like he said, like, 
you know, he, some of his clients worth billions and you will not know if you meet them on the street because they're so yeah. humble. And some people, he said the worst are actors and celebrities. They act, I mean, we have Kevin Spacey right now, oh, yeah. you know, talking about He's broke. losing, yeah, bro. <laughs> well, we don't know if it's actor or not. He probably not that broke. But uh, he said that, you know, you go through divorce papers, you know, you see their bank accounts, you see assets everything. of debt and everything. So, but my question is, why do you think, you know, someone who's worth $20 billion, who self-made, appreciates the hard work, why wouldn't he, you know, buy a few books from someone who's hustling? Because yeah. that's what we do. Like, I feel like a roofing business owner, if someone knocks at your door like a little kid, we'll just <sighs> buy just for the sake of it. Me too. From so, that. Yeah, exactly. J just like, hey, wh why wouldn't? But why wouldn't he buy? That's a good question. We got to ask Jim Walton that. Um, he said we're pretty dialed in on books. That's what I remember. It was him a re respectful answer. He's a nice guy. And I'm like, whatever, I'm not going to sell him. But um, I'm that way. I buy from everyone. In fact, I saw so many no soliciting um, signs going door to door with Southwestern that I told my wife, once we build our dream home, which we have, we're going to have a sign on the house that says soliciting. Get rid of the no. Wow. <laughs> just because I've said no soliciting Pitch so me. much in my life. I'm going to say soliciting just to mess with people. And, you know, because I do, I like to buy from it, anyone that comes to our door. Because you respect the game. I because respect you, the game. You've done it. 100%. But it's interesting because in our culture today, so we have two types of business owners. One is very flashy, kind of show it all, designers, clothes, and all of that stuff. And, you know, G wagons and, you know, cars. And then other type is very wealthy, but no one knows about it. Exactly. Why, why do you think is that? Um, they don't care. They don't, they don't need to be flashy. I mean, I like that, that style. I mean, we bought, we built a nice house, my family, but very, you know, modest vehicles. We don't need to spend I don't know why. Pe and I think when you want to grow in business, it's more of a game at some point, right? You, you keep score with money. You don't necessarily need to buy a bunch of nice Rolex or stuff. That's not me. I don't think it's you either, right? What I notice, and this is just personal observation, because I see people, you know, buying Lambos, buying cars, and I have no problem with that. Like, but my thing is, rich people, they're smart and they understand their place in the marketplace, and they it's a game for them. Like, why do we know that? Uh, founder of Google drives Prius. Why do we know that Jeff Bezos used to drive Honda Accord? You know, because, you know, in the roofing business, for example, why do we have such a big turnover and why employees or sales guys always go for their own? Because if a business, I would argue, if a business owner is flashy, like, you know, if you drive, you know, $250,000 car and you have three sales guys, how long before one of those sales guys will want what you have because you you're flashing in front of them and i would like you know if you're a founder of you know any company and someone is making 10 times less than you mm -hmm. but they see the business model what's stopping them to do but now yeah. if you're just like them if they see that every day you drive a similar it. car you're just like them I feel like that drive, like that competition doesn't exist. They don't want to compete with you. They want to help you because no one wants to build someone's empire at your expense. That's how people feel. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in 2024, more than ever, I'll give you one example. We were puzzled here at our team at Business As Podcast. We traveled to uh, Perfect Steel Solutions in the Midwest, Indiana. And we did a one and a half hour podcast. Amazing guy, built amazing, you know, $10 million metal uh, roofing company. Uh, Ryan, you just met him. He did two sound bites from that interview. We're not thinking about, like, a lot of times people think that we're picking up, like, what's gonna, like, what's most controversial, whatever, and that I do it. Oftentimes people listen, it's like, oh, that's good sound bite. So there's a sound bite in that interview. And he is saying that he's in the Indiana, so there's a big Amish community who don't pay taxes, and he has to compete with them because it's cash under the table and you know whatever. So it's hard to compete in that community, right? 
unfair advantage. He, he sure. can't do the same thing. And then there's also a lot of manufacturing. And he said, you know, I paid $24, $25 an hour, you know, for gutter installers, and you can stock shelves for that price. I mean, my daughter just got a first job at $15 an hour at Lee and Chin. Nice. So they pay, you know, $20, $25 to do the shelves where, you, you know, no training, like restock shelves, easy job. And he said, I can't pay more. Like, I can't compete with that. It's so hard. So anyway, we chopped it up and throw it on. It went viral on TikTok. It went viral on YouTube and on Instagram. And the amount of hate we got, I could not believe it. Number one comment is, pay more. You're <laughs> rich. You, because people, people start looking into that guy. We have more stitches on that video than ever. So they took that sound bite that this guy cannot pay more than 25 bucks an hour and say, well, the answer is easy, pay more. And oh, be because his dad is very rich. So his dad, you know, you're talking about Bentley, he sold his company for like hundreds of millions, whatever, but it's not him. And his dad is rich, but he built his company on his own, whatever. But they found a picture, him driving his dad's vehicle from 10 years ago. He's like, maybe you don't drive Bentley and pay people more asshole, right? And I'm like, well, where's the entitlement coming from? Why do you compare? Like, first of all, 25 bucks an hour is good. That's like, a lot of money. Yeah, and if you tell me to charge more, are you gonna tell me how to me to charge more? Like, to pay more? How, go open a gutter company and pay people 25 bucks an hour and try to actually make a payroll every Friday and, you know, because it's a competitive marketplace. Right. But that's what's happening. People look what you have more than ever. I often say that in, in America, we like success, but we don't like successful people. You know? Like to tear them down, right? People, yeah, people like successful stories. Right. But they don't like people behind it. That's why it's always like, oh, Jeff Bezos could end, uh, you know, Most. hunger, yeah, in, <laughs> in, in, in Africa. No, he wouldn't. Even if he, you give everybody $10,000 within six months, you know, whoever was rich, Gonna use it, they're gonna, poor, it. They're gonna get Build down it right to back. the yeah. You're exactly right, and even um, Elon Musk with his his bet on the Tesla, fifty six billion dollar payment, and and the government's actually trying to make a law or change that because he bet on himself, yeah, and he was right. Take some big balls to do stuff like that, but exactly, he's getting paid for it. So back to your story. After that job, you did yeah. more than door to door sales for other companies. How did you end up in Pinnacle? Pinnacle Insurance, all right. I'm a very lucky guy. I'm definitely not entitled, but my dad actually started Pinnacle, but he didn't start decades before me. He started about two years before me. He was a farmer's insurance agent before that, and he started the agency and was able to kind of move some of his book of business from farmers. And then I came on a few years later with the door-to-door -door model, and I just killed it it was so he worked for other companies farmers insurance for like 20 30 years okay. when he was 62 he went independent which is unheard of wow. because you have this big book of business and i hope to get into that a little bit so he started his own company did you always want to work for your dad did he fight it it was i i cut my teeth in the real world with other businesses like um selling cable door to door and and stuff like that but i was ready and i always knew Hey, the beauty of insurance, especially when he went independent, it's like I can literally knock on 100% of the doors and know that, you know, I can help the majority of them. So, and save them money because when you're independent, you have the different, you know, the options for people. And I always had that in the back of my mind. And then mm. something happened. I actually got fired and uh, from my, one of my prior jobs for doing nothing wrong, but it was the perfect time. I kind of wanted to because I was like, all right, now it's time to go, you know, work for Pinnacle. Started working, and I think the first day I got, and I still do it to this day, I get about five to seven leads an hour knocking on doors, just saving people money on their insurance. Wow. So um, I got into it. I bought my dad out about eight years ago. And again, very lucky that my dad started it because it costs 50 to 100 grand to start an agency. Wow. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without him. Um, but I bought him out, and since then we've tripled the size of our agency. We work very hard. About 3,500 clients, about 14 million in premium, a little over two, two and a half, roughly. Only in Minnesota, revenue. or you work other? Just uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Minnesota and Wisconsin, awesome. What is the most valuable lesson you learned from working with your dad? To um, 
kind of what you said. You, you lead by example. You work hard. You, you got to set a good example for your employees, right? And if they don't see you working, they're not going to want to work hard. They're going to think you're entitled. That's the worst thing, being a second generation guy. Mm. Definitely not entitled. I still go door to door. You know, I'm doing this, which is outside of my comfort zone, but but definitely I'm excited to do it with you. And yeah, simply work hard and have big balls. I mean, the ball, when he was 62 to do something like that, Stay when company. you know these other agents his age are golfing and they're just taking their monthly checks because you get the renewals, residual income. What drove income him? What check. drove your dad to start an agency at 62? Not the money. If you, um, he was done for he 25 was just years. tired of farmers, tired of the captive agency model where you're like an employee. They really have their thumb on you with quotas and changes and the rates were going up and he wanted to really take care of his clients better and when you're independent you have that ability to move them from a different one carrier to the next which is a huge selling point of being independent so um yeah he just didn't think twice and and went for it and i'm i'm very lucky and grateful he did we still have a great relationship and sometimes that gets rough with having a business partner as a family member but Thank God we're still really tight. And he comes in the office about three times a week just to drink some coffee and shoot sure. the shit. So. so people like that don't, <laughs> don't ever retire. Like, no, he's a bit. Yeah, he's he's got to have to keep moving. It's funny because yesterday um, I have a, I was in Pennsylvania with Lance Backman and we have this uh, almost heated debate about selling the roofing business. He said he doesn't agree with me. So I always said that there's two reasons to be in business. One is sell it, another one to pass it to your kids. He's like, I don't agree with it. You should not be selling your business to your kids. You, you should only be able to sell it. And and I agree with it. I see his point clearly because I don't want to push it to my kids. I don't want to even solicit to them. But I also love generational business. I also love when son continues dad's yeah. stuff. I mean, there's there's something about it. There's big, huge corporations out there and where, where do really well when son takes over dad's empire. Yeah, it can be pretty magical if it's done right. And yeah. one of my friends um, or companies, Asphalt, Ericsson Asphalt, I think they've got 15, 20 family members in it, from grandma all the way down to... Very cool. Yeah, you know, all the kids and grand it's sons, it's amazing and they have a great relationship, but it gets tricky too with with the family members. So I don't know what I would do with Pinnacle, potentially let my kids earn it or buy it from me and never that, giving that, it to the, anyone. I'm buying my dad's out too. He didn't give me any. I'm paying him a huge check every month still. <laughs> but and that, that's the key because that's why they say that, you know, business usually ruins in the third generation. You're right. Yeah. You know, it's that's true like that's freaking numbers like we is. have to do it right yeah so you can't make it easy you got to make them earn it love it your website says you still go door to door selling insurance with your kids what oh yeah what motivates you to keep doing it and uh how your kids feel about it they're pretty good i mean getting back to um like third generation if they want to be you know, I'm kind of anti-college. I'm very anti-college, unless you want to be a doctor or a lawyer. And there's so much opportunity in this world, like literally going door to door. Now, my kids are 10 and 11 right now. So a lot of times they just hold the pens, but they're learning slowly yeah. what the business is about through me just busting my butt. And they see all these leads I generate. And at some point, I'm going to turn turn it over to them and say, you want to go door to door? Get us leads. We're going we're gonna to put these in your name. When you're 18, when you graduate college or graduate high school, sorry, graduate high school, I want you to be making a hundred thousand dollars a year. Wow! That's and it so doesn't powerful. have to. It doesn't have to be insurance. I mean, they can start a business, shoot, you know, all the trades type businesses like a pressure washing business, pool cleaning business, dog. My daughter has a dog poop picking up business. She started like this two is weeks so ago. So cool. <laughs> Like my kids have the same mentality. People just don't realize how good we have it here. The buying power of people, you know, you can't do it on. The, you just can't do it on the other countries. Like the buying power is not nearly, but also also mentality. Same thing. My kid is a thirteen, and like you know what he did the other day, like last summer. Uh, instead of doing like lemonade stands, I don't know where he's getting his ideas and stuff. But he he went on Amazon and bought this. Um, plastic tubes like uh very cheap they're 
a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Then he bu buys this candy, boils it, and makes like a juice. And then he pours it in this little, uh, like like a popsicle. Yeah. Then like freezes it. Tube, right? Yeah, uh -huh. like freezes it. So now you have like 10, 20 of them, like ready to go. It's like it's, it's like a ki melted candy, in a so it's it's not very sugary. It's very tasty. And then he goes sells them for like three, four, two dollars or whatever, like way more than you would sell. Uh, um, it's cheaper and better and easier to sell than lemonade because you don't have to have a stand. You can just walk with a bucket. Nice, nice. And then he'll go. This is what blow my mind. He said he would not stand, ask for people to come. He would find where garage sales are. He goes to the garage sale and offers everyone at the garage sale and Good comes back with the money. Go to where the people are. It, it, it's <laughs> insane. It's like, who taught you this? And that guy is always, his sister, my, uh, two girls, so he is uh, number two and I have girls number three, number four. They uh, uh, One day they needed quarters for something. It's like, hey, Nick, do you have quarters? He's like, sure. Six quarters for two dollars. <laughs> when I heard that, I'm like, "Who are you?" You know, three, learn from you. Three quarter for a dollar. <laughs> like, I mean, it's genius. Like, he would not change. Ruthless. Ruthless. Your own family. But but very nice. Like very nice guy. Very I'll shine respectful. Shine the quarters for you. But like, no, you need something from me. It's valuable to you. He six quarters for a dollar. Make that profit. I'm like, unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. It's great. He's just in, but he's so smart. He's a, the most generous kid I know. He always have money, never spends it, knows how to make it, always super creative. And they do it. Our kids, man, do it. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, for me, like, he just did this thing. So I, I have a rule in my house. If you wake up, you have to read 10 pages first. You have to read something spiritual, like a Bible or devotional. Then you have to read a regular book. Then you have to exercise, and then you can go on your device. So they all do it every morning mm -hmm. because I don't want eight hours of screen time, no. whatever. So they do that. But then it's the summertime, and like it's not enough. You, the balance is still off. I mean, you do all your thing that I ask you to do in 20 minutes, and then you still have six hours of TV. Sure. So I require you to learn something every day, like learning, like a skill. If you go to YouTube, you better be learning like freaking Spanish or craft or whatever. So my son comes to me, he's like, with the iPad, he's like, that. I just did this 3D design for like iPhone holder, uh, like j just showing you what I did. And he, he doesn't brag about it. He's not, he's just, he spends 15 seconds showing this thing to me. Just like, by the way, mm -hmm. I did it. I'm doing what you asked me to do. That's why I'm playing computer game. And I'm looking, like, if I would have a 3D design for TV hall, I mean, I would brag about it. I would be so proud of myself. Mm -hmm. He just did it, like, on the back, like, okay, my dad asked me to do something. And then he goes and prints it, at, like, at school, whatever, like, 3D. And then I see this thing at my house, you know, iPad holder. He like has a 3D it, printer or whatever? Uh, yeah. We have one at home, okay. but he they have a project at the school. So he did it on his free time at school. Wow. His, he says Nikita, his name in it. I'm looking at that thing. I'm like, I show it to my, like, there's a bowl that connects it. Like, so there's multiple parts. There's mechanics involved. That he built 100%. Yeah, 100%. So starts to, unbelievable. Mm. And it's not a big deal for them. So, for, like, my message to all the parents out there, load your kids. Give them those tasks. Mm. You know, you will be surprised. My daughter does a CrossFit with me. Like, my daughters, you know, one does boxing, and she's asking for My 16-year-old daughter just told me the other day, so we're listening to podcasts. Uh, I took her to Chicago for the concert, and we're driving back, and we listen to CEO of Diaries. There's lady who was in Secret Services, and me and my daughter listen to the podcast, and she loved her two and a half hour podcast. She's like, I love this woman, and uh, she was the woman was talking about exercise, and she said that like every time she feel down, she will go for a run. She said that when I don't exercise, and my daughter exercises every single day. Every single day, she has like 15 pounder. Actually, she asked me to teach her how to squat, how to deadlift. Every single day, she goes either on YouTube, type, finds a reading. So we listen to this podcast, and she tells me, it's exactly how I feel. This is exactly why I exercise. Every time I'm down or depressed, or like, I exercise and I feel better. And I'm like, who are, like, if you build that, if you show it, like, and I never, ever ask my kids to do it like with me. But I notice every time I go to my garage, and I have like fifty thousand dollars set up. I have every machine in the book. There's every time I do it, like I will spend like an hour. I have one kid around me doing the rope, like doing something behind. Mm. We we don't talk, but they come out 
and they get motivated. I have a big TV in a, uh, in a garage and I usually put like CrossFit game motivational video or something. Kids see that or like a boxing video and they go and do it. So we have a boxing coach coming to us every uh-huh. Sunday. Like, dude, we owe it to our kids. You have to not only show them, but give them the task and you will be surprised how fast they will do it. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, we underestimate our kids. Whatever you think you, your kids know, double or, or triple yeah. it. They know way more. High expectations, right? Yeah. Believe in them. Yeah, my son this morning, he he shot, he texted me. We just got him an Apple Watch. Not We're anti-technology too, by the way, and Good cell phones, we're going to pay him $10,000 a piece if they don't have a smartphone until they're 18. So we're going to, we, but we do want the Apple That's Watch good. so they can text their friends and stuff. But anyway, he texted me this morning. From the phone. Yeah. From the watch. From the watch. This is his first text ever. He's yeah. like, Dad, I did three buckets of balls because we're a big sports family. Baseballs, three buckets of balls, and shot 333 uh, baskets. Nice. You know? So I was like, that's awesome. That's <laughs> you so know? cool. It's great. By 8 a.m. Love it. What's your best sales tr- tip or trick when you go door to door with your kids or yourself? What do you do now? Like, how do you sell? What's your approach? Hey. Um, I'm Troy, Pinnacle Insurance, right down the road. Um, I bet we can save you money on your auto and home insurance. By the way, (laughs) I'll talk. Thank you for coming because my wife actually called me yesterday. She's like, not going to lie, Dimitri, I'm mad right now. And she wasn't like mad picking a fight, but she's like, I just got off off the phone with our insurance agent. So perfect timing for this podcast. She did not know you came. (laughs) So I have two speeding tickets last year. And my car insurance Matry. went up two hundred dollars per month. So I asked her, like, per month on top of it, like, what year? Yeah, two hundred dollars per month on top of what we've yeah. been paying. And I have three cars. So I'm like, how much? Is a sixteen year old driving? Huh? Uh, not yet. Not yet. She's a, she has a permit. She's driving. She's gonna get it in yeah. a couple months. Get ready, man. It's. <laughs> I I know. I know. Which is one of the reasons. I mean, auto insurance is a mess. It's almost what's as big going a on with auto insurance. Home. Why it's such a big mess? Because that's what our agent told us. That the r- rates are going up, and you know they already were going up because we also were up to for renewal, and they check your record, mm-hmm. and we ask like, can we shop around for insurance? And Good he luck. said, well, yeah, you're gonna go with a five year now, so you have a f- five year record, not just last year, and you yeah. might even end up paying more. Um, you know, from roofing, inflation is crazy litigious society people are suing more than ever even umbrellas are more and more challenging to get for people because carriers are paying out more money than ever so you blaming lawyers i'm blaming lawyers i'm blaming the cost of vehicles and bumpers and the technology and everything it's so much more to to, uh to repair repair yeah you have all the sensors you have all and um Insurance industry in general is in turmoil, along with home insurance, which I hope we can touch on too. Sure. Um, hail is a mess. You know the you know the state. Pretty much everybody talks about Florida. Sometimes even to this day, they're like, "Oh, the reason rates are going up is because of Florida and California." You know what? I would I would bet to say the entire country is not Florida. Mm. Not as extreme, but it's not. <laughs> It is extreme in Minnesota, trust me. Well, usually it starts there. It usually starts in California, Florida, or whatever, like, you know, like the busiest, the most, you know, advanced states or the where you will have the most hurricanes. But yep. what's your take on uh, insurance crisis in Florida? Because for years we've been talking about insurance crisis in Florida, but then such a big debate, you know, seven, eight companies go out of business, but did they really go out of business? Because they still have yeah. assets, they still have money. They do, but they're losing money. And I don't, I'm not an expert at Florida, but I have a lot of colleagues and friends down there that say it's a mess. The hurricanes and the flooding are the big thing. Sure. And I think Citizens is one of the only, so you, which you, is almost you, like a state funded agent. Or yeah, you don't believe there. it's made up. You like, No, I don't. But these insurance companies aren't stupid either. And there's a reason they have the big buildings in all the cities. So to go real quick to one of the things I wanted to talk about today is, um, Rates, the real victims are the homeowners right mm-hmm. now. Because their rates tax. are doubling and tripling. 
in the like the last five years, every single company across the board, and I'll just speak to Minnesota, is going up about 30, 40% a year for the last two, three years. And have people's incomes gone up, you know, double and triple in the last five years? Heck no. So it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting, it already is an interesting time because people can't afford their, their rates. And at my agency, we are dealing every day with probably 10 people calling in saying, this is unacceptable. My rates went up a thousand dollars last year and now they're going up $1,200 this year. We didn't budget for that and we can reshop them. I mean, we have some of the best carriers out there, but half of them are getting out of the business. They make you bundle. They won't write you unless your roof is within 10 years they or your house age is 10 years or newer. Um, and uh, if you have any kind of record, any kind of claims, even a zero payout hill claim, and you better Still not have mean. multiple in five years, which pretty much everyone does now. Yeah. They're just looking at you like, okay, this person puts in a lot of claims. We don't want them. So it, Uninsurable? It's getting harder and harder and harder to find people, find carriers that want to insure people. Or you will uh, pay more in premiums. You know, or they just don't want to write you. And that's what's, I mean, carriers are leaving the state. Carriers are just giving declines. Is and it, uh, would you say it's harder to start insurance agency now, like independent? It's impossible. It's impossible. You can start. So what your dad did, what, 20 years ago? It's not possible today. When did your dad start? Yeah, he went independent about 17 years ago. 17 years ago. So, so 2005, 2006? Yeah. So when I came to the country. Uh, so you would say what he did is impossible today? It's possible. I mean... But it will require more money. What, to get what it takes contracts. To, no, no carriers are giving you contracts right now. You have to try to sign on with an aggregator, like an SIAA or an Atlas. And I don't know if you know that. It's kind of like a way that agents can get contracts because they are a group, like an association almost. So it mm -hmm. makes it easier. But going direct and getting a contract is darn near impossible. Like our top carrier, I'll give an example, Auto Owners. Great, great company. And they... I think put on one new agency last year, way up north somewhere, none in the Twin Cities. And they're probably not gonna put on any this year because the scary thing is they're afraid to write more business and they can't get enough rate. And which comes full circle with the roofing industry and but hail. The, but why they're not writing more? I mean, isn't it like sales move things around? Like, why, why aren't they writing more business? Why don't they wanna write yeah. business? They're paying out more than they bring in in premiums. So if they're bringing in a thousand dollars in premiums and always pay out fifteen hundred dollars total, I mean. But that's not what. what, what all right, let's talk about like. Be, help me understand this on yeah. a, on the biggest um, scale. So your State Farm, your Allstate, because those are publicly traded companies and stuff, and they have a public statement. So I review their financials, and I never mm -hmm. could understand it. So someone like State Farm, I remember like 2018, 2019, you know, in premiums, they collect $65 billion. They pay out $5 billion or so. Like $5, 6000000000 billion a year, that's what State Farm, you know, pays. And then you have your overhead and stuff, and they, they stack money away. So why do we say that they lose money? Where's the money going? I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. And I guess there's different reports out there. Yeah. But State Farm is not make. I mean, that'd be like 20 30 you know, 300, 3,000%. So like they, they would report a good loss ratio is if you bring in 65 billion, maybe you pay out 63 billion. They're, they're not playing the game to make that much more money. But the problem is in this day and age, they're paying out instead of like that 65 billion example, they're paying out 75, 85, 95 billion dollars compared to every 65 they bring in. They're paying out way more money than they're that's making, not what which I, is why the rates are going. So their net profit, I remember like all state profit would be like three, four billion a year. So like State Farm, if they bring 65 billion, that's the reports I've seen. Like because I covered this like 2019 to 2020, I did not did like recent years, but the, on paper they're read, they're making like four or five billion, like 10 percent net almost on uh, what they bring. 
Ten percent. So that yeah, that's what they were reporting. So they would pay out five billion, and they would make five billion, and the rest is like operating expenses, allocation, like all of that. Mm -hmm. But they're not. State Farm does not pay out fifty billion dollars. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like even if you look at the cost of, you know, like hurricane. You know, that's like $5 billion, $10 billion hurricane, like for entire, like worth of damage, they say. So we don't, like, that's why roofers don't understand it. Lawyers don't understand it. Like, I guess I don't, I probably don't fully understand it either. All I know is that the jig is up and <laughs> rates are doubling and tripling. That's because true. Because back in the day, insurance was for that life-altering tornado or fire that burns your house down. Now you go to a neighborhood in Brooklyn Park, let's say, and every other house, almost every house has a fifty to hundred thousand claim dollar claim every five years. Think think about that. If they're paying two thousand dollars a year in their home premium, how does an insurance company make that make that up? Yeah, but you have so many houses that but almost a- there are so many houses, but almost everybody in the Twin Cities has had a hail claim recently. And if an average what is what's an average hail claim, let's say? 15, you would, 20 twenty thousand maybe twenty just for the roof uh well I mean in Minnesota I mean you'll go from 10 to there used to be 2018 2019 used to be like 10 but everything is you know prices probably. went up yeah yeah so I would say probably roof probably fifteen thousand and all around maybe like 30 on average yeah 30 so if your home insurance premium was two thousand that would be 15 years of zero claims for the insurance company to break even. But I, my counter to that is the stories where people pay for 30 years and then they have a claim, they get denied. Mm-hmm. So they get punished for, like, I, I hear those stories a lot in Chicago. So a lot of hardworking guys who have been with the same state farm for like 30, 40 years, they file a claim first time in their life and they're like, oh, we'll that drop. would be frustrating. Yeah. I have their back too. I see all angles. Yeah. I definitely see that side. I see the roofer side saying, hey, they need to get this money because the insurance company is insuring them for it. I see the homeowner side. I, I pay all this money for insurance. I should get it. My side as an independent agent, I'm kind of on the uh, side of we're getting inundated with with claims if there is that, that terrible hill claim. And we don't get paid extra on it. Nobody's going to feel sorry for me, but I can't sell more insurance if all I'm doing is talking to people with claims problems needing to put in their claim. That's my job, though. But we also get hit, and this is good for your your other uh, roofing companies that follow you to know, we get something called contingencies, which are bonuses based on our loss ratios. And it's a lot of money that we could and should be getting, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But we almost never get it because of hail so right now. And it's not our fault. <laughs> you know, it's n- I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> always been curious why insurance companies are not going after uh, shingle manufacturers because not only about hail so we have a lot of wind claims not only in, in Minnesota but all over the country so shingle manufacturers you know put out their promises and their claims right like you know 130 mile wind warranties and mm-hmm. right and then 60 mile wind comes through yeah shingles blown think off for sure go after them you know why but you never see that claim is a claim act of god whatever and then it and i'm talking about one two year old roofs so it's not something old manufacture uh, sh- uh insurance companies are huge smart they have money they have legal and all of that why they're not coming after shingle manufacturers i agree with you that's a great idea subrogate <laughs> they can pay the claim and then go to the manufacturer I don't know how that works. You know, I do know some of our carriers are getting more serious too about fraud. I know you talked about that on some of your podcasts mm-hmm. when, you know, every time about midsummer when people are like, oh, we haven't had a hailstorm yet. And those roofers with their $100,000 trucks payments. And do you see a lot of vandalism here? In, in- I think there is. I think there's more than anybody wants to admit. I think there's billions of dollars of vandalism a year mm. to get roofs bought. And, you know the carriers they're talk they they have you know drones now satellite even talking about looking for the vandalism more and prosecuting i don't think it's like a pro- it's a problem where people need to go to jail for it i think it's that big of a problem instead of oh man we'll slap you on the wrist and say 
um, don't do it again. I mean, if you're damaging someone's property intentionally, it's a felony. You should go to jail. But no, but it doesn't really go that far. And I'm not saying every – there's great companies. Out there. I know a lot of great companies here in Minnesota that would never think about doing that. But I think there's a lot that do too. There, there's something happening to society. I can't explain it. I cannot understand it. I refuse to understand it. I was in Greensboro, South Carolina two weeks ago. And we're checking out at Lowe's, uh, you know, check out. And this, you know, man checking us out. And he was, something came up with about theft. Like, and I asked him a question, like, how, how, how big is the theft here? He's like, oh, every day. So someone just stole something. And he said, are you going to call the police? He's like, nope. I'm like, why not? And he said, well, we know them. Like, and here's what he told me, the Lowe's guy. So he said, we are waiting for the, like so they're documenting it they see the cameras he said it happens every freaking day i mean if you look at like a, a like you know walmart theft they'll have like three million dollars a year worth of theft i mean think about that number but here's three what, million y- yeah like per store okay yeah. per store like you run a small store like walmart it's insane mm-hmm. you can't p- c- call police but this guy tells me this he said um we have we know who they are we know what they do we are waiting for the number to go up so we can lock them. Ah, uh, they're creating like a file on them. You've stole the... Exactly. So they, they, every time, so the the people coming in, they're stealing like your nails, your whatever, but there's cameras everywhere. So if you steal, let's say, 100 bucks and you call the police, you're not going to get much because there's a... I think he told me it has to pass like either $3,000. There's a minimum. Mm-hmm. So if below that uh, number is this. But after that, that's a felony. That's a jail time. What's not? Mm-hmm. And and I'm thinking there like how crazy it is that you have to sit and watch yeah. people steal from you. And I feel like insurance companies are doing something similar because... If you're creating damage here and there, maybe it's not big enough. But I do see that we do get persecutions. It's almost like they have to make a case out of it. But I feel even like roofing insights, and I'm not bragging about what we do, but I know I've heard it hundreds of times now that people, like when we start exposing people, love it or hate it. Even Lance Beckman yesterday said, like, I hate your scam alert videos. But, you know, even my close friends told me, Adam Sand, my close buddy from Canada, he said, Dimitri, you know, I always think in everything I do, like it, it kind of became a thing. Like, would Dimitri cover me? Like, <laughs> what people, would Dimitri do? <laughs> yeah. Would Dimitri call me out on this? Would Dimitri That's make a, good, a video about yeah, it? Yeah. Because people like are conscious now because now you have a media that can make episode about you. And YouTube is huge. Like, you don't want people to Google your name and have a YouTube video exposing you because you're done. At that point, you are done. You can't scam people anymore. Mm-hmm. And I would argue that YouTube and media in general is more powerful than even a court system. That's why, you know, scammers, big people, like I'm a, tomorrow I'm doing the news on this guy, and I'm telling you, he's not going to do what he's been doing. He's not so, going to be happy? Yeah, no. <laughs> so he's a, so the guy filed bankruptcy, and he's a coach now. And actually, I don't even pick those stories. My team does. They look around, and he's he still have victims today. He's a homeowners who he needs to refund money and stuff, but he's going and teaching how to be a successful contractor, how to manage debt, and how to be careful with debt. But borrowing money is good. Exactly. So he's giving financial advice. And I'm, like, I'm just putting him in a pit. Like, hey, guys, this guy's you know, teaching. Here's his class. Here's the post. Right now, he's selling course. But here's what's happening. He filed bankruptcy, yeah. and he's in the local news. But again, even in local news, it's not as powerful as YouTube because people are not going to find local news one year from now, but YouTube with the search power, it never goes away. Beautiful. If, yeah. And I feel like... It's like going to the fat personal trainer. Yeah. Why are you going to do that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but the thing is, um, insurance companies are making examples of few roofers here and there. And I feel like when you do that, now others will be afraid because yeah. now that's a precedent. Like, oh, I don't want to be that guy because your career is ruined. And why? It is. It should be ruined at least. I agree. Theft. But it, but why? Why do you think we have, I mean, we started this conversation with how great the country is, how easy it is to make money. Our kids are hustling, making money now. Uh, Dan Young told me, called me last week, said he has a kid, you know, 16, 17-year-old. 
said he bought to buy his first house. You know, he'd been saving money. 16. See, Good it, for him. imagine that. Like, imagine mm-hmm. opportunities we have in this country where, you know, your goal is your kid to have $100,000 when they graduate school. That guy, boy, boy is buying his first house. I mean, my kids now, like my 11 year old daughter, I took her to the Five Below the other day. She brought her wallet. And I'm like, what do you have there? There's like four or 500 bucks. I mean, I came to this country. I have $200 to my name. Yeah. My 11 year old daughter has $400 and she's not spending it. I'm like, where do you get this from? She's like, birthday. She's hustling, right? She's saving yeah, it. Yeah, like grandma, grand, like $100 each birthday. She's not spending it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow. But and but then you have roofers, you have other people who just have to steal. You have to go to Walmart, you have to go to Lowe's, and steal a gun, steal a tool. Ridiculous! Like take advantage of the country. I mean, we're in the best country in the world. Do, right? do you feel like our uh, our um, system is broken? How we punish? Because we also have more people in jail than any other country on earth. We have more jails, more people in jail. <laughs> That's a deep question. I mean. I think more people should go to jail too for doing the real <laughs> crimes. But I thought marijuana was a stoop. I mean, I'm glad we're trying to get people out of jail for that. I think yeah. that should be legal. It's basically legal now. Yeah. But are you telling me people that sh- basically shoot people and some people are getting out on bond for ridiculous crimes right now? I think that's a big problem as well. You, you, you know, the deepest thing I've heard on, on this topic is, and it's very, very sad. I was watching... American Greed actually about an episode on uh, We Work. I watched like, that too. I, one of my favorite shows, American Greed. Yeah, yeah, I love it. That, that guy was a whack job, but yeah, brilliant. The lady who worked for him, she said yeah. a phrase and it stuck with me. She said, CEOs get away with everything. In this country, like if you're a CEO of a big organization, most likely you're going to get away. Like, how many CEOs? I, that guy, We Work, he scammed you know, people for billions if you think about it. He's a billionaire living in Miami, still, still not prosecuted. A lot of people got He's screwed. Like a cult leader. Yeah, and I mean, someone lost million. Like the his investor, like the Japanese guy, yep. lost five billion dollars, and this guy became a billionaire, and he lives in Miami. Gotta love this country. <laughs> you gotta love this country, but we also have to prosecute. But I, what I also like, like in my country where I come from, and I would argue there's a lot of countries around the world like that. You know, you go to Russia. If you're a billionaire, it's almost guaranteed you'll never see the jail time unless you really do something against like Putin and whatever. But billionaires, you know, we have tons of cases. What I love about this country is it's not perfect. There's a lot of stuff. But it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you drink and drive and you hit someone on the road, right, you go into jail. Like your billion's not gonna buy you out mm-hmm. of like if you kill a person and there's a witness or there's whatever. I mean, of course there's gonna be you can hire lawyers and stuff, but you're gonna see the jail time. In Russia, if you like top like any position, if you're mayor of the city, and and we have tons of those cases because everybody's drinking and driving, right? So many cases, you drink and drive, they'll have it on camera, they'll have witnesses. If you're mayor of the city, and you're in Putin's party, you're not seeing the jail time. You're untouchable. There's so many untouchables. Mm. They will have, uh, we have one case in Moscow. It was actually very loud. Big accident in the middle of, of Moscow, head on, very famous doctor here, and like uh, executive of oil company here driving, hit, she dies, doctor dies. This guy opens the door, goes in the back, his dri- driver or security goes back, sits like here. He was driving. You know, immediately a few co- high end police forces, whatever, FSB came in, write it up. Nobody will ever go to jail. Officially, it'll be like, all right, that guy was driving, not me, and boom, done mm-hmm. deal. You don't see those people. It doesn't matter how. But in the United States, we still have it. And I mean, right now, they're actually making cases. What's her name? Uh, Theranos? The, uh, oh, the. Blood. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. So she's in jail right now. Like Mm -hmm. she tried to play victim, whatever. But I mean, think about that. You know, she was like next Steve Jobs or whatever Mm -hmm. the case is. They're going to send you to jail. Good salespeople. So that's actually one of the good examples of a CEO of being prosecuted. But 
CEO is getting away with a lot of stuff. Yeah. And sure, you know what? Who else? Um, I remember Home Advisor, um, companies like Home Advisor. So, FT, you know, they're scammers, right? Absolute scammers. FTC finally, you know, fined them like $7.2 million for fraud and like whatever they have to pay out fines. But CEO of Home Advisor got paid $78 million back in 2018, made him highest paid CEO in the state of Colorado. I mean, think about the freaking number. I mean, think about where's money coming from. They're scamming contractors. They're selling fake information. It's really? Not, I don't know enough about Home Advisor, but yeah, but even FTC, like State of California, sued them. You know, government did like they have tons of lawsuits, tons of, you know, they are prosecuting, they are paying fines, but they still get away with shit. People at the very top, doesn't matter how much you're getting exposed with lawyers, you're freaking protected. Untouchable. You are untouchable. Hey, Dimitri, can I, I, I had something I wanted to touch Go on. Ahead. And um, cause I know I've watched a lot of your, your podcasts. I love your, your videos. One is network with independent insurance agencies sure. and owners, you know, agents to get those leads. Because like, I remember 2017, June 11th, you do too, right? That yeah. storm, I probably had 400 leads within a week to give out to roofers that I know and trust. And I did. Um, and, you know, I don't see any money of that. One of the reasons I like to do it, obviously, is to say you have damage, you don't have damage. And for the roofers out there network networking with insurance agents, the worst thing you can do is go out to a lead that they give you and then have that client end up calling the agent back saying, well, the, this roofer guy you referred me to says I have damage. Now I, there's no coverage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now there's no coverage. And what are you doing? He says it's damage. And now I want to fight it. And now I'm in the middle working. The, the biggest thing I want to do is refer it to a roofer. Have that roofer tell them they have damage if it's good damage. Tell them they don't, though. And then be able to say it in a way that they're okay with it. And you have to be pretty good at that to be able to tell a homeowner, you might have a few dings. It's not worth putting in the claim. Hmm. So in some of the roofers I've done, you know, I learned real quick, okay, I'm going to refer to this guy because he doesn't put in a claim for everybody. He tells people they don't have damage. So we're saving the insurance company's money too. We're doing what's right for the client. We don't want to have all this fraud. We don't want to have all this waste in landfills. When somebody has a three-year-old roof and you have a few dings on the on the shingles and the siding, and it's like nobody knows. I almost feel like uh, if I were you, this is like just brainstorming right now, but if I were you, if I would be giving away leads, I would ask for some kind of report back to me what happens to that, you know, whether it's damage, no damage. Mm -hmm. It could be simple form and stuff. But if you have, let's say you have 400 leads and you give away 400 leads, and then, you know, you didn't get anything in return. I mean, you're exposing yourself. That's why, you know, I came up with the directory. I don't give better recommendations. Like if I, if you give me 400 leads and I give it to my 400 contractors and they screw up, I feel like I owe you. I feel like I have to make it right with you. Like, because, you know, if I tell homeowner, I have a roofer for you and that roofer does anything wrong, they come back to me and say, Dimitri, and I do it all the time. Like, you know, I feel like the person who give out recommendation is responsible for the recommendation. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, I have a great roofer, hire him. But if something goes wrong, you, you know, do your due diligence. Yes. You, you should do, well, that's why I ask for recommendations so I don't have to do due diligence. Exactly. And, and I would never go that far saying, you, get, you should really use this guy, he's great. Because yeah. one of the problems too, when you get that busy, if you're used to doing 10 roofs a year, you have 100 roofs to do. If you're used to doing 100 roofs a year, you have 1,000 to do. Yeah. And stuff gets messed up. And I'm like, if you want someone, I have, I have some people. But I, I want to check out directory. We'll have a conversation about that for Absolutely. sure. I like that. How? Do, what do you think about insurance programs, though? Because a lot of insurance, what they do is uh, you know, they enroll contractors in their program. They give their lease. But now they tell them how much to charge what's fair like your managed repair programs you fan of them what do you think i don't this? have a ton of experience with it but all i know is stuff like that is happening deductibles are changing wind hail deductibles are changing like crazy what is it now actual like what's the average what's where is it going i mean nationwide went to one percent a lot of them are going to five thousand 
you know, over 500,000, 10,000 over a million dollar house. So it used to be, I remember back in the 2015 to, to 20, is like thousand dollar deductible. I know. Sometimes 500, 500. So we don't have that anymore? Bro, that has changed. It's changing quick. Like deductibles are higher. Actual cash value on roofs is happening more and more. State Farm is going to an endorsement where you have to pay 10% roughly on your, over and above your premium you paid this year when you renew just to have an endorsement to um, pay for undamaged parts of the roof or whatever. I don't know what ex how exactly it works, but everyone's changing, and it's changing quick along with the higher premiums. Actual cash value roofs, meaning if your roof is only has if it's a 25-year roof and you have 12 years left, they're going to pay you half of what that roof's worth. Wow. Um, same with scheduled roofs. It's very s similar. So things like that and, like like you said, the preferred – Vendors, I haven't really encountered that, how that works, but um, everything's changing. And have you seen on your end with how claims are handled, like not getting paid out as much, higher deductibles? Is that? Yeah, I, I feel, well, I travel all over the country. So I go to, you know, your Arizona's, your, you know, both costs, like New York, Texas. Every market is different, but changes are everywhere. You're right. Like it starts at California, it starts at, Florida, but then, and I don't know the driving force here. I feel like there's, uh, after COVID, something is happening to people. It's not just lawyers. It's not just contractors. I feel like one of the biggest drivers here is economy itself, because we did not have recession for a long time. What a recession does, it humbles us. When you're dry, when you, like, recession weeds out weak competition like people who don't want to work hard. So I feel like it's a time, like we have a low hanging fruit for so long. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to, to become a contractor, so easy to sell a job. It's every, like people forgot what it feels like, how hard it is to find a job. We forgot hard times. And right now we're at the worst times in history of the United States probably where you know, like why we have what we have here here compared to the rest of the country. Because when you have a abundance, like a, you have a lot of free time. And when you have and free, free money, free, <laughs> free money, free time. Now you have time to do stupid stuff. Now we have time to talk about genders and freaking pronouns and stuff like that. Because, you know, if you think about it, like if you would have to work. Eight hours, or like you don't have time for that shit. But if you sit all day and someone provides for you, now you know all you do is eat, watch, and consume. Mm -hmm. Well, th this consumer mentality is horrible. And now, it's like on, idiocracy. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. <laughs> and now, on top of that, on top of that, you also have social media, and you so you have consumer behavior like consumerism at the highest peak. But then you also have social media. We keep showing you what it, what you yes. don't have, what you can what you have, need, what you should strive. To exactly. Have. So it's like oh, you don't have anything exactly. compared to these other people, exactly. beautiful people. So it's never, and they're all lying too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think what's happening is we all go crazy, and but it also goes even on the highest level, even on insurance level, on the highest executive level. Is like who's gonna buy a bigger boat? Who's gonna commit the biggest fraud? Who's gonna be next? I don't know, Belfort or Madoff. Like, it just... They're out it, there right now. We don't even know. And even politicians. Like, even where the government is actually, is, you know, oh, let's send $50 billion to Ukraine. Let's print more money. Let's raise the ceiling. It's like, I feel like we're in this computer game and we don't realize... When's it going <laughs> to blow up on us? When's it going <laughs> to... When's this bubble going to burst? It's got to. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what's happening. And I, I don't feel like, and we're all getting affected. Like we, we, it's, it's not real because we forgot what it, like we forgot what crisis is. Yes. <laughs> to grind, to go through hard times. Like I want a crisis, honestly. And I feel like so many people from Russia, Venezuela. You're prepared for it. We're prepared because we've been like, my grandfather lost it all. My father lost it all. In 90s, we lost it all. Like, I'm talking about where people on the streets, you know, 100, 200,000 people like waiting for the bread at the store to wake up. Like when you don't have stuff to eat, like that kind of like go to Venezuela right now. See see what people have to go through. I mean, I love it because it 
creates better person in you, grateful person, grateful for the bread, for the food, for mm -hmm. the opportunity. Because when you have it all, how long do you, that's why third generation businesses yeah. ruin. I agree with you. So that's what's happening. And I feel like it's a combination of those things. It's a combination of greed, waste time, like, I don't know. Social media, you know, the government pumping in seven trillion of money for Stupid. COVID. Oh, yeah. Print, printed money. Printed All we money. can do, Dimitri, is take care of ourselves, our family, our friends. We have to do we'll every day God. what's good. Yeah. And we're going to be all right. That's all we can do. We can't worry about all the external stuff happening. But we have to adopt, though, and that's the problem. If you're a good guy in a like in a situation like this, first of all, it's a very hard to compete with the bad guys now. If you think about like bad and stupid and ugly, because like it, it, let's talk about wages, right? So I'm a good guy and I create a good job, you know, and I I feel like I pay fair wages. But then you have a riot. You have 100 people demanding more wages, right? Where is that coming from? <laughs> yeah. You, you know, like and you want to make a profit. Yeah, you want to make a profit. The owners of the companies you, can and, literally go broke paying their yeah, employees but, the minimum wage. Adopt. So even if you do everything right and you grind, now you have to adopt to stupid behaviors and expectations and entitlements of other people who are not willing to work hard, not willing to do what you do, but they're telling you how to run what your to business, do. and they yeah. demand something from you. And w remember when <laughs> people talked about fifteen dollars an hour? It was a lot. Yeah. Now, like a minimum, now it's twenty. And guess what? In a few years, it's gonna be twenty-five dollars an hour minimum. I guarantee it. Easy. It's it's it, already half. It's there. already half there. Yeah. I have a few more questions, brother. In your industry, I'm guessing you see a lot of people in their worst moments. They might have have their property damage had loved one passed away how do you stay motivated as a pot and positive as a leader do you do you deal a lot with the losses or it's not part of you your know, business i have a good story for that i had, we had a total loss fire um it was probably 2018 new year's day and the person had triple a and somehow through some phone calls my phone rang you know i wasn't drinking i don't drink and so i got up at like six in the morning on new year's day and uh, went into the office this guy um, had been drinking and lighting off fireworks, but I'm in my office New Year's Day. I'm like, I'm going to take care of this guy. Um, and basically what happened, he's lighting fireworks, put him into his garbage, put the garbage can next to his garage. Somehow the gar it embered and started the garage on fire, burned the entire house down. He lost three cats. I mean, it was a terrible thing, but the family was safe. Thank God. But that's what we, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you have insurance for the life altering, life changing terrible moments and you're there met with him for coffee got him some money to find a place to live and got a hold of the i couldn't even get a hold of a person to put the claim in because it was new year's day everybody had time off and you know it was just <laughs> a terrible time to burn your house down <laughs> but anyway um yeah i mean that motivates me to help those people in their, their greatest times of loss and kind of going back to like a hail claim one of the carrier reps said this Imagine if we all self-insured and hail, let's say nickel size hail hits your house and a few dings on the roof, siding, gutters. Um, are you going to write a check for $150,000 in windows, you know, to replace everything if you have a few dings on your house? No, <laughs> but that's where we are right now where there's, there's hail. All of a sudden, a door-to-door -door guy comes by. Okay, you might have twenty thousand dollar roof. Then it turns into the windows, the siding, the overhead and profit. Let's get the public adjusters involved. Let's and then the neighbors get you know the uh, neighboritis where they need to do the same thing. Anyway, that's another side of it, which is frustrating for me and frustrating for everybody in the in the industry. But uh, the motivation is definitely there to help people at their their greatest times. The life changing, even auto. I mean, we sell umbrellas. We've had one person use their umbrella maybe two in 15 years. But if you have that terrible accident where you kill a doctor or something at an intersection, and you're going to wish you had that umbrella 100% of the time. It's 200 bucks a year. You'll n probably never use it, and you hope not to use it. But when you do, that's the life-changing stuff because you kill that doctor, they're going to garnish your wages of 30% for the rest of your life because you're probably not going to have a few million dollars in the bank to write a check for the, what your liable accident that you caused. So that's that's definitely 
what mo motivates us and keeps us going. Can you share the biggest mistake you have made as a leader or in this journey? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <sighs> come on, Dimitri. <laughs> think about it. Take your time. Um, I think we all, this is a, a mistake. I could do it. Just the day-to-day, -day, getting involved in the day-to-day -day tasks. I should do what I'm good at. The biggest thing I can do is get leads for my company. We have three salespeople. I could go out today and get 20 leads in a few hours. Why won't I do it? There's nothing more valuable than giving them 20 more leads today where we could probably sell half of them. Um, but I'll go back to the office and check some emails and talk to the team. And, you know, so I would say the mistake is just not focusing on the, the massive revenue generating activities that that all of us as business owners should be focused on. Love it. Just like uh, I'm reading and got hooked on Dan Martell, Buy Back Your Time. Oh, yeah, I got that book. This Love is it. like the main thing. That's right. Love it. What's the biggest misconception people have all uh, about insurance salespeople and how would you debunk it? That it's easy. It's no business is easy. Sure, we get renewal income, but my team is slammed every day. A lot of it with the rate increases with this hard market. And myself, I mean, I'm getting inundated with customers too that I know personally that are calling me. Why did my rate go up three times in two years? And and you have to you have to just tell them, hey, it's the market. I'm sorry. But um, what was the question? What's the hardest part? It was the biggest misconception people Misconce have yeah. about insurance salespeople. Like me, for example, as an agency owner, that all I have to do is go play golf all day. You know, that's not my goal. You know, I do have a gut. I'm not as in shape as you, but... You're pretty... But, you know, I'm not... We're not the typical agents. I mean, some of them are. Some agents don't want to grow. I believe if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're rotten. We put all our money back into the business. We're not trying to plateau and keep as much as we can, you know? So nobody's getting rich. We're just trying to grow our company and and scale and get bigger and bigger. And we, we follow EOS, um, Traction. Yeah, You're probably yeah. familiar with that. So we have some huge, huge goals where we want to triple the size of our company within 10 years, which would be a lot of, you know, good for everyone. If you could change one thing about insurance industry, what it would be and why? Get technology. I mean, this is a boring answer. Make technology easier. A lot of the carriers, they're they're not, they're built on old old DOS type platforms. So you can't zap, you can't integrate, you can't use technology like like some of the newer, you know, CRMs and 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 whatnot that are out there. So I would just make everything talk, be able to talk to each other. Everything more seamless mm -hmm. would, be, would be nice for our industry. Love it. Last question for you. What's the one fact everyone needs to know about insurance and why? You, you want to use your insurance for the big losses and just take a long, hard look the next time hail hits your house. And know that the the door to door guys are going to come out there, and I have nothing against that. I'm a door to door guy too. There's legitimate hail. People should be taken care of. But just think, like I said earlier, if I was self insuring and I had a few dings on my turtle vent, I'm like, am I going to pay a hundred grand to replace everything here and go through weeks and weeks of people on my roof and permits and banging and, or am I probably going to have another hailstorm in a few years anyway? And do I really want to waste all this stuff and, and go through this process? And by the way, I've seen my rates jacking up like crazy. And there might be a correlation here as to why this is happening in the industry. So just think think hard. Go with a good local guy. Go with a good team like Directory that vets their people and stands behind them for sure is another one. Since you said it, I did not plan it, <laughs> but I want to. I want you to react. I was just thinking. I have a perfect example of, uh, and I'm just curious what you think about this. So this is a, a roofer. Uh, I downloaded from YouTube. A roofer inspecting a roof, and I want you to see this inspection. And. Uh, We're <sighs> One minute. Everyone thinks the one or two year old roof or even five year old roof, when they look at it and they don't see hell, that they should walk, walk away and say no damage. Well, Mike found two hits. He asked me to come out here and find more damage. 
So sometimes you got to get on your hands and knees, and you literally got to look for these smaller spots. Here, of course, the tail has been knocked off. A lot of times, it's like, don't count the ones at the bottom. Well, count everywhere the hail has impacted and ask questions later. You're not a fucking scientist. You're a roofer. If it's a black mark, if it resembles hail, is it close or is it something else? Who fucking cares? Circle it. Take a picture. Um, now, my experience in 20 years is throw shit up against the wall and see what sticks. This roof is mm -hmm. legitimately damaged, but I got to get more circles. I got to show the damage. So what do I do? Okay. I see it right here. What do I do? Let's see. I know I'm going to see it. I'm going to fill it. I'm going to wrap it up right here. This one here is a total loss, guys. Boom. Do you agree with that approach? No, and, I don't. But, but you see a lot of it, right? There's a lot of coaches. This is a coach. Um, you know, if you see it, if it looks like damage, a black mark, Right, and I, I just love the <laughs> ending. He's like, "This is total loss." Did that roof look like total Throw loss? Throw another to you? shit in the front. That roof's gonna last twenty years all day long, right? <laughs> and it's probably five years, ten years old already. Yeah. But yeah, they give the good roofers, and I'll shout out to a few roofers I know, like Josh Swisher, North Face. I don't know if you know him. Mm -hmm. Scott Ricks, Andrew Benson, great guys that I, I, you know, I've referred, but um. A lot of great roofers out there, and there's a lot of guys that give, give you a bad name, and that's kind of ruining the industry too, and ruining insurance. And because imagine if we have, imagine if that neighborhood, because there's a lot of houses in that neighborhood, we ha we can have total losses in the entire neighborhood. There, what I'm concerned about is you know, tens of thousands of pounds of materials yes, in the landfill. The waste is we have the waste, the new materials. The, I mean, if we don't have to replace it today, can we do it in five years? Can we do it in ten years? Like, why not? Exactly. I, I agree with you. And one of the sad things is another angle. It's like that guy in that house that probably has three new roofs in 10 years. Let's say he's put in three roof, you know, big claims in 10 years for his new roof. And his neighbor hasn't put in one claim. That new guy with mm -hmm. the new roof has lower premiums by half. So you're rewarding somebody with by putting in all those claims and giving him lower premiums. So... I don't have all the solutions either. Well, well, thank you so much for coming. What I would like to do, I would like to visit you, your office, maybe next week do like an oh, office that'd be tour. Fun. Yeah, heck yeah. That'd be great. Let's do it, brother. Let's go. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Dimitri. Good stuff. Guys, comment below what you think about this episode. What do you think about insurance game in general? How is it changing in your market? I read all of my comments and I'll answer them if you have any Questions for Trey, ask them in the comments below as well. But comment below, what do you think causes the issues that we have? Is it lawyers? Is it roofers? Is it economy? Do you agree with the topic today? Comment away. I'll see you guys on the next episode.